Hello and welcome to Shipping Education, a quality education division of Data Spread Mumbai. You will now be watching the lesson number one in the series of video lessons on shipping and logistics. The lesson is titled Introduction to Shipping Business and Industry. The manuscript of this lesson is available for registered course participants. In this video, you will be introduced to this wonderful industry that is responsible for transporting nearly 90% of the world's total trade. But before we continue, please be aware that this is for educational and information purpose only. Our course lessons shall not be considered as business or investment advice for which you must consult your personal advisor. Shipping education will not be responsible for any direct or indirect losses arising out of your business ventures. We are also not responsible for your career or employment options or opportunities. Now let's get started on the lesson. As I mentioned a while ago, shipping industry is responsible for global trade and in a way acts like one of the indicators of the state of world economy. Some of the other indicators being the unemployment rates, inflation and energy prices. While this industry is so influential, it is relatively less glamorous and much less understood. One way to get a starting point is to look at the interplay of stakeholders. In this video, I will briefly describe the role of some important stakeholders one at a time. Shipping industry can be studied from the theme of transportation as well. But please do remember that there is more to shipping involving the entire life cycle of a ship. It means that the topics such as shipping economics and statistics that help determine the need for new ships, ship design and modeling, a ship's actual construction, her seaworthiness and navigability, navigation, safety, rescue, salvation, maintenance and finally the braking. These subjects or topics are more on the engineering and technical side and only impact our lesson topics occasionally. For our lesson discussions, we must consider three things central to the subject, the ship, the ocean and the cargo. For the cargo to be carried at low cost and th the ship is required and for the ship to become commercially viable, the cargo is required. The ocean and the related infrastructure acts as a basis for this activity. Let's quickly look at the ocean part. For commercial shipping, the ocean provides certain safe sailing routes, also known as trade routes, with somewhat predictable weather. Ports are cons constructed at some places where the ocean's interface with the land remains calm, conducive for the ships to remain stationary. In some locations, even naturally formed channels make the harbor easy to enter and navigate. In some other locations, so-called artificial breakwaters help break the impact of the incoming wave energy and create some stability for the ship. In all, in the commercial shipping point of view, knowledge on the ocean or trade routes, harbors, ports and other types of waterways is inseparable from other topics of academic interest. We will learn about these topics in a systematic way in the lessons that follow. The next topic of interest would be the cargo. When the cargo is traded, there is going to be a buyer and a seller. But the reality is more complex because between the seller and the final buyer, there could be a number of intermediaries. Some people with no shipping background misunderstand the term shipper to be a ship's operator or owner or a worker. Please understand that a shipper is one who, the ships, who ships the cargo and initiates the process of shipping. So he is strongly related to the cargo and not related to the ship at all. 
he might not be the actual seller. Sometimes he could even be the buyer. He might not even pay the freight rates. He is just initiating the process and generally known as the shipper. Legally, he could be called a consigner. The consigner is intending to make available the cargo to a consignee after the transport activity is over. Since the cargo's owner does not move with the cargo until it is delivered, it requires a representative that looks after the cargo's interests, such as clearances and the related documentation. One such representative or agent is the custom house agent. In different countries, the custom house agent is known with different names such as a cargo agent, a customs agent or freight forwarding agent. But we must understand that the main purpose of cargo's agent is to make sure that the cargo will successfully cross all the hurdles of handling and fulfill all regulatory obligations. The agent will take information from the seller or the buyer and will represent that information only with various customs and similar regulators to move the cargo from origin to destination. We will study more about the greater concept of representing the cargo's interest in our future lessons. Now the ship. The ship just like the cargo requires a representative too. She has to comply with hundreds of local, regional and international rules and laws besides contractual obligations. The company owning the ship deputes the captain as a representative by default. However, the captain will not be able to discharge several of the obligations. So during the entire course of a time charter or a voice charter or even as a liner calling various ports regularly on a scheduled timetable, the ship will have one or more agents representing her interests and ready to discharge the obligations on her behalf. So we call these agencies as ship agencies. However, in different countries they may be called as steamer agents or general agents. Among the 4000 odd ports in the world, some are completely automated but some use semi-automated systems to load or discharge various types of cargo from the ship. Manual intervention is required in these cases, meaning that skilled labor will be involved. The men on the company that employs them is known as stevedores. Ports generally issue license to operate as a stevedore. It is common in many ports to see a single company acting as a ship and custom agency as well as the stevedore. Now let's see what the port has to offer. Some harbors are formed naturally and some are created artificially because it makes sense to create one due to the hinterland conditions. Harbors are the big picture while the port is an integral part of the harbor. Harbors include navigational channels, anchorages, signaling facilities and the breakwaters. Ports have very strong concrete submarine and supermarine structures known as wharves where the ship can be moored. Now mooring means to tie the ship to make it more stationary. A properly moored ship will be stable and can be worked on to load or discharge cargo, perform short term repairs and receive supplies and fresh water. The ownership of the port facilities is possible in public, private or in public private partnership. Sort of a joint venture. So the purpose of port and harbor establishments is to provide safe and conducive sailing and landing facilities to visiting ships and earn revenue. Now let's take a look at the ship owners. Ship owners are typically large companies. They have access to qualified and experienced professionals and capital. Ships are usually purchased on huge loan components and freight earnings are used to service the loans. Ship owners have several choices to conduct their business. One is to run the so-called liner business or service across fixed ports of call on fixed schedules. Most container services run as liner services. A second option is to lease out the vessel to another party who have their own cargo to be transported or would run in turn a cargo transport business. 
these companies or individuals are known as charterers. The ship leasing business has an age old and peculiar name, chartering. Chartering is a fairly complex activity and must be conducted subject to law and international norms. The contract governing the rules of a ship's charter is known as a charter party. The charterer will act as the owner for the said duration and will be able to appoint his own agents in various ports. Please remember that oceanic transport is risky in many respects and therefore requires insurance both for the cargo as well as the ship. We will study these topics of marine cargo engine and hull insurance in detail in our future lessons. Now let's look at a ship's common parts. Now we are looking at a very general bulk carrier. This carrier has a cargo compartments known as hatches. This is a hatch. This is the second one. We can see that this ship has five hatches. It also has ship based cranes. One, two, three and four. There are four cranes. Now this is a container vessel. We can see that the containers are lined up or stacked up on the, on the surface of the ship as well as under the so called deck. Now we are looking at an oil tanker. This oil tanker has a somewhat different type of construction wherein it has uh, holes or cargo holes that can have well protected um, oil uh, tanks you could say and the oil it could be petroleum it could be diesel or it, it could even be crude and it can be carried safely on this oil tanker. Now we are looking at something known as a roll in and roll out ship or a row row ship. Typically these ships are used to transport brand new automobiles and vehicles. But there are other uses for a row row vessel as well which we will study in future. What you are looking at is a war ship. You could see that it's pretty much lean and mean. It's very powerful. It can travel faster. It is loaded with weapons and it is sailed through international waters subject to international rules and regulations of maritime warfare. Now we are looking at the hull or the general body of a ship under construction. This ship seems to be a, a bit small but even a larger ship would have a typical hull under creation and the hull is typically made of very strong steel structures. Now this large complex equipment and machinery is in fact a marine engine. Now this is one of those rooms on the ship known as an engine control room which would have uh, somewhat superior controls in the hands of expert navigators. This room is known as a communication control room or a radio room or even as a communication bridge. Now we are looking at the underwater view of a cargo ship known as the bow. This is known as the bow. It looks like a bulb so it is also called a bulbous bow. Now the same bulbous bow is out of water and probably in a dark area. So you could see the construction or the shape of this specific bulbous bow. Now what you are looking at is the underwater view of a cargo ship's propeller. The propeller is also known as a screw. Sometimes a ship might have twin screws that is two propellers it might have side by side. Now you are looking at the same propeller in the dock yard where it is probably undergoing some kind of construction or repair activity. Now you are looking at the cargo hold of a cargo ship. You could see that these little packages are being worked out and they are being stacked up using different types of cargo handling equipment. Some ships might have extensive piping system particularly the tankers on board the ship itself. Like I explained before there can be cranes on the shore and there will be cranes on the shore as well as there will be some cranes on board as well. So jointly they help the cargo move in and out of the ship. Now what you are looking at is known as a deck crane system. You are looking at a shore crane system. As you can see this is the shore area or the wharf. Now this specific location on the ship is known as a load line. A load line is one that determines to what extent the ship can be loaded in different weathers, climatic conditions and on ocean trade routes.
Now this lesson comes to an end and thanks for watching.